Welcome to the Market Huddle with Patrick the Content Machine Serezna and Kevin the Macro Tourist Muir. So grab a drink, get comfortable, and get ready for a deep dive into the markets. Take it away, guys. March 7, 2019, episode number 18. I'm Patrick Ceresna. And I'm Kevin Muir. Thanks for joining us this week. Uh, we recorded this a day early on Thursday to accommodate my travel schedule. Now, this show is broadcast as both a podcast and on YouTube. So if you're enjoying this as a podcast and you feel like you're missing out on the charts or the videos we're referencing, you can register at the markethuddle.com website to get the weekly emails, which include the chart pack and video links, or just flip over to YouTube. In this week's episode, we welcome special guest Mark Spiegel, who's, uh, let's just say he's probably the most famous Tesla bear out there. Uh, and in this week in trading history, we're going to go back to 2009 to discuss when the S&P 500 put in its low at the end of the great financial crisis. We're going to move on to the WTF clip of the week where both Kramers have been drinking. And then we'll end with the top five most important things to watch ne next week. Let's jump right into it. Patrick, who's the show brought to us by this week? Well, this week, uh, the beer is called The Extremist. It's the uh, Napanee Beer Company. It's a Belgian-style IPA. Again, we're, we're on a roll with these strong beers. Wow, this is like a 7.2% alcohol. And uh, it's, it's, the, it's the flavor is uh, taken to an extreme full of intense uh, aromas of pine grapefruit and citrus paired with a rich uh, fruit and spiced character oh my god we're, let's find no. out what the hell so we how got. canadian is that that the beer tastes like pine like <laughs> <laughs> anyways let's open her up yeah no shit that this has got like a wow that's like full it's a it's a rather fruity isn't it it's a little more spruce than pine i think <laughs> Okay, let's get into it. I got to do my legal stuff. So here we go. Clients and employees of East West <laughs> Investment Management may hold position in securities mentioned in this podcast. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in this show. For more information, please visit eastwestfunds.com. Side effects of too much market huddle may include nausea, bloating, the feeling of emptiness, <laughs> and or the condition known as squiggle squish. I, I, you, you made me swallow funny, dude. Like, I, uh, oh, you, <laughs> shit, that's, not, that's a bad way to start the show. Okay, let's just get on I, to I the market. I couldn't even breathe. Was, all right, let's, let's, let's get Mark on the air. Okay, joining us now is Mark Spiegel, actually a good friend of mine that I've known for a while on Twitter. Um, and I guess he almost needs no introduction because he's the fellow that, uh, has not the greatest things to say about our favorite little uh, electric vehicle stock, Tesla. So, uh, Thanks for joining us, Mark. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you on our podcast. Yeah, it's, it's great to be here and finally uh, be able to talk somewhere about Tesla. <laughs> yeah, that's right, because you never bring it up otherwise. Never. Um, I just want to kind of get, get, get your reaction to uh, a, a, Twitter, a tweet that I saw the other day, and it was like uh, by this fellow, Dave Austin. He said, I had to block that TSLA daily rah-rah guy, Gerber Kawasaki. And he said, Elon Musk could take a shit in a broken light bulb and he would think it's worthy of a Nobel Prize. <laughs> and I thought, oh, geez, that reminds me of something that what Mark would say. <laughs> well, that's a funny. That's actually funny. I got to start following that guy. There are um, there are a lot of people who who would swear that that Gerber Kawasaki is a parody account. But, I'm, you know, apparently it isn't. I'm told it isn't. And. And I know people who have met with him, and there, I know some people doing a documentary who have filmed actually both him and me for this documentary. And um, he's apparently a real guy. It's just mind-boggling. I mean, I mean, he's the ultimate, you know, bull market, you know, um, stock jockey. Go, you know, he's, he's a future Uber driver, except Uber will probably be out of business when this market crashes. So <laughs> I don't know what he's going to do, but it's not going to be what he's doing now yeah. anyway. But uh, yeah, you he blocked me a what, long time ago. What, I can't even what, follow him. That, that's crazy. So, so Mark, why don't you walk us through kind of your short thesis on Tesla and, uh, 
and tell us why you think that these guys have got it so wrong in terms of with their their long positions. Well, I mean, look, I, I mean, you know, basically it, it's pretty simple. They're, they, they, Tesla is like the worst in class manufacturer, um, and and everyone else who knows how to build cars is coming out with electric cars that are that are much better in just about every possible way, and that's that's probably. 90% of the thesis. And, and the other 10% is that Elon Musk is just a lying, pathologically lying fraudster. And as bad as the financials are at Tesla, I'm, I'm sure that, that the reality is even worse, you know? So, um, wow. but look, you know, when I, when I started on this crusade, which was probably back in 2014, you know, the market was much more divided on Tesla. I mean, there were guys who had been short this from like the thirties who, crapped out at a hundred dollars and you know and got destroyed and and then there was me who I, I put on a tiny position in the 90s but in the 90s of dollars but i got really big in like the mid 200s you know which was sometime in 2014 when it had that run and, and that's when i got really vocal about this because everything that's happening now i saw four years ago you know i mean you know look they're selling more cars than i thought but you know they're losing a ton of money and there was a massive sort of margin for error built into how this thing was valued back then, you know? So, um, but now, now it's like, it, it's almost consensus that this company is a joke. And there's just, I think just a, you know, there's retail investors and a handful of institutions who are still kind of holding it up. And, you know, look, before you say, you, before your trading instincts kick in and go, oh, well, if that's the consensus now, then, you know, maybe you're on the wrong side of it. Um, no, I mean, it's a consensus that, you know, that a piece of dog shit sitting in the street is worthless, right? I mean, and, and if, you know, and if, and if you poll a thousand people and 999 of them say, oh, that's a worthless piece of dog shit, and one guy, you know, says, oh, no, I'm willing to pay, you know, $276.59 a share for it just to, <laughs> just to pick Tesla's closing price tonight, that doesn't mean it's worth 276.59, right? It means there's one idiot who just hasn't come around to reality yet. And I think that's the, the situation here. There's more than one idiot. There are a number of idiots, but the fact that that consensus is rapidly turned on the company, I think does not make consensus wrong here. So Mark, it's Patrick here. And I just wanted to ask you this. Now, now do you, are you in that Chano's camp where you think this is literally we're zero or is it just that this is a monstrous overvaluation and that this thing is you know a $40 stock in the long term or something like what's your overall uh, thesis in terms of how this ends yeah I, I think it's literally worth zero uh, now at least because of the amount of debt that's involved in this thing by the way Tesla literally just filed uh, an 8k here that they've Let's see, a syndicate of lenders in China for an unsecured 12-month term loan for RMB $3.5 billion. What's that, about $500 million to use towards their, their gigafactory? And let's see, amended restated its ABL credit agreement to increase the total lender commitments by $500 million to obtain some additional commitments. Okay, so they're, getting, they're borrowing more money, which I love. So this actually ties very well into your question, which is – there's there's too much debt on this company 10 11 12 billion of debt and you know tens of billions of purchase agreements with uh, primarily with panasonic sort of take or, or pay deals where um and there's too many liabilities i mean under reserved warranties and and this deathly you know deadly autopilot out on the road and and there's like over 500 lawsuits against the company so yeah i mean you know somebody may want to give this a try on a smaller scale out of out of bankruptcy, you know, once all these liabilities go away, but I, I, it's a zero now. I mean, look, is it impossible that, you know, that some stupid money might come along and say, all right, 20 billion, you know, post money. Yeah. Okay. But you know, so then it's a, what a mid, mid to low double digit stock price. Okay. But you know, there, there's zero chance somebody's going to buy this company for $200 a share or $150 a share or a hundred dollars a share or anything like that. So so, so you don't think 420s in the cards? <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny is when I heard that 420, I mean the stock was, you know, trading maybe 380 or something when that happened. Yeah. And I shorted more because, as you would too, because obviously, oh well, he just limited my upside, you know, or you know, my my risk. 
it, oh. to forty dollars, and and I, and there's three eighty the other way. I, so, I, well, I'm going to step in here, Kev. I'll, I'll say it because we were uh, – Kevin was speaking at the Macro Voices Live conference in Toronto, and we were having dinner uh, with uh, the whole uh, cast of, uh, of uh, speakers that were going to be at the show. And that was exactly what uh, Kevin said at the dinner, right, Kev? You were basically saying it was a, right. a, a no-brainer short because they've just uh, capped the maximum risk on the trade and actually created asymmetry for the first time. Yeah, so because right, up until that point, you just didn't know where it was going to stop, right, Mark? You could like, who knows? It goes to three eighty, it goes to seven eighty, it goes to a thousand. You know, the madness of crowds. But once he said the four twenty bid, you knew that he wasn't going any higher than that. So it, the first time, it actually became much more shortable at that point than it had ever been before. Yep, that, that's one hundred percent true. And and you know, guys who had um, you know who had sold like you know five hundred dollar calls you know, all of a sudden were like thrilled because they, they went right to zero, right? And then they came back kind of when the deal fell yeah. apart. But was, what was funny was because I'd been so vocal about this thing that in the days after that happened, I got calls from all kinds of class action lawyers looking for a lead plaintiff. And they're figuring, oh, you know, this guy's been a loud mouth on this. He must have lost a pile here. And, and I, I said to them, no, actually – he actually put on more and he goes, yeah, we called all the really big funds and they all told us the same thing. They either did nothing or they sorted more. Nobody, nobody of any size covered into this. Apparently the, the, the only guy of size, some size, it was, I think, low seven figures who did was, uh, was Andrew Lepp, the Citron guy. He got kind of spooked and, and covered and lost some money, but you know, to his credit, he, look, Andrew's not the greatest fundamental investor, but he's, he's happens to be a pretty good trader. And, and he, I think he made a lot of money long Tesla coming into that two, three earnings report, you know, so I'm, I'm sure right. he made all that back and probably more, you know? So, so, okay, go ahead. So Kev. go ahead. No, Patrick, no, go ahead. Go. Well, I just, I'm just kind of flabbergasted at how this has become the story stock for this bull market. And that's, I, I guess Patrick and I have spoken about this, you know, in the past you've had other big story stocks that, that have collapsed, that have kind of marked the end of a bull market, whether that be WorldCom in, you know, or, or Enron in the, in the two thousands. And then, you know, the Lehman or the, 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 the financials in 2008. And I just wonder if Enron or sorry, if Tesla, we're going to look back at this and we're just going to be like shaking our heads going, how were we so stupid? How did we get sucked into this? And, and it's just really all that it was, was uh, like Elon taking advantage of the massive amounts of liquidity that was in the system and promoting his stock. Right, and so well, I, I, I'm just wondering if go ahead, Patrick, Mayor Mark. Yeah. I don't think I don't think people are going to look back and say we. I think people are going to look back and say they, meaning like a small handful of people, you know. So, um, you, you know, because I mean, this is this is the year of social media where it's all over Twitter. I mean, there's a lot. I mean, a lot of the pressure is off me now, in a sense, to be so vocal on Twitter. I just have more fun with it than anything because. There's, as you know, there's this whole crowd of people and smart guys. I mean, a lot of them have experience in areas I don't. And, and they're almost all financial pros in one sense or another who are on this sort of who use this tag TSLAQ, which, uh, you know, for any listeners out there who don't know, you get the Q stuck on the end of your ticker when you trade in bankruptcy. And and so, you know, that's all out there. It's so obvious. The real question is, how did a handful of institutional investors and, and then a bunch of, of retail investors who just – this is some kind of religion for them. You know, how are they so blind to this, right? This is probably different from, from WorldCom, which turned out to just be an outright fraud where they just made up all the numbers, right? And, or Enron, for that matter, which had a lot of, of real institutions in it. So, you know, and the other thing is I, I don't think this company is big enough to, to sort of take down the whole market. I mean, you know, fifty billion dollars isn't that impressive these days, right? I mean, if this were a, a three or four hundred billion dollar company, it might be a different story. And well, I mean, the other you thing know, is, Mark, it, yeah, but the question, yeah, well, so the question is though, Mark, is 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 it only going to collapse once the whole market collapses? Will you know Elon be able to keep the ball in the air with all the liquidity? Uh, and no. is that that's kind of I don't think it's going to take the. You think it's going to it could go down regardless? I think I think this stock. I think the DOJ could 
could slap a pair of handcuffs on Musk tomorrow, and this stock, you know, could be zero overnight, you know, or, or five dollars overnight, or or whatever. It, this, this what's going to happen here can be completely independent of the market. I mean, it has traded independent. I mean, for for years it went nowhere, right? While well, Nasdaq was up, whatever, thirty percent or or whatever the number is. So. Yeah, no, this doesn't need the this doesn't need the market to collapse for it to collapse, especially now. Okay, I so, mean, the, the the thing is, the guys who own this, they're like, they're sort of like revenue momentum guys. They're they're not just stock momentum guys, but they're like top line growth, top line growth, top line growth. That story's over. This is now a busted growth story. This thing can collapse very quickly. So, Mark, okay, I want to ask you this. Now, uh, there was that one quarter uh, with the, uh, that uh, they just turned a pro- supposedly turned a profit. Uh, I mean, is is th- was that just uh, smoke and mirrors? Like, is is this company still like big cash burn or not? From a cash flow well, perspective, well, so there were there were two quarters. Uh, there was Q three and Q four of eighteen. The Q four profit was smaller. The the, the gap profit. Uh, was smoke and mirrors uh, because they they grossly under reserved for warranty without getting too far in the woods here and then they booked you know um, um, uh, GHG credits they're basically regulatory credits for making electric cars and that's not repeatable internationally I mean they've skewed that very very much locally and you know they may have done a lot of other shenanigans that we don't know about yet but we'll find out one day if they did them but they also the main thing is they they blew through, you know, like two years plus two and a half years of backlog from those Model Three reservations, and that's gone now. And now the inventory is piled up. So th- whatever whatever profit they had, or you know, they were cash flow positive, but but they were cash flow positive because they slashed capex to the bone. I mean, it's completely completely not. Um, um, you know, what's not compatible, I there's a better word than that, with, with a growth story, you know, with, with, especially a car manufacturing growth story, which is hugely CapEx intensive. So, you know, they pulled a lot of nonsensical levers and, and made up some some gap numbers, you know, on the expense side and, and you know, showed this profit. It's completely not repeatable. Q, this the quarter we're in now, Q1, could be a massive loss and they'll never make money again. I, I mean, it, you know, in desperation, they just came out with the you know, the $35,000 version of the Model 3 and the $37,000 version, they're going to have a multi-thousand dollar uh, EBIT loss on those cars on, on like a per unit basis, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, they're done. I just, I don't, look, I don't know if they're done quickly or slowly, which is why I'm, I'm short common stock. I'm not trying to do this with parts. I've also sold some way out of the money calls just because they were so juicily priced but i don't know the timing but i know where this is going right you know what what bugs me about this story is is that uh the entire auto industry as an aggregate is so incredibly competitive that uh, i i don't know how he can ever make a legitimate profit margin trying to do this on a mass scale like i've never been able to connect the dots and i, I think at the beginning you were implying that's that's like 90 percent of your thesis right yeah. um but yeah. It, uh, but it, it's like I, I i just you know if this was some sort of a brand new industry and they're the the innovators within there, you know, <laughs> it, it, yeah. that that uh, that would be one thing. But I mean, this is the car industry, uh, and and there are some, there's big money and big players out there that that uh, are catching up. If and, and like you suggested, maybe even already passed them in terms of the technology. How long until uh, uh, these other companies like BMW and so on are all getting these cars uh, out there um, in mass? Like, well, is, is this yeah, a 2020 so, story? This is a, this is a right now story. I mean, I mean, Jaguar rolled out the I-Pace in December. It's, it's been reviewed as being better. This is on the luxury end, being better than yeah. the, than the S and X in just about every head to head comparison, you know, that was done independently. That wasn't done by a, a Tesla fanboy blog. And Audi has its electric SUV. The e-tron literally rolls out this month, March in, in Europe. And next month in the U.S. and Mercedes rolls out its first electric SUV uh, in in June in Europe and in January uh, of 2020 here in the U.S. And Audi has two more electric 
uh, models, actually one, two, three more electric models following in the next two years. And Mercedes is going to electrify every single, you know, letter in its line. You know, the E, the C, the first one is the C. They're going to do the E, you know, the S, the whatever. And, and BMW, you know, they have the little I3, which is actually a good seller in Europe. But BMW gets serious on the luxury end. Uh, actually, I think they're out in 2021, you know, so two years from now with several models. And then on the lower end, Hyundai and Kia have gotten terrific reviews on their electric SUVs. And, you know, the Japanese will all have them like a year or two from now. So it's happening now. I mean, the S and X are going to be down 25 or 30 percent in sales this year, maybe more worldwide, thanks to what's coming out from from Audi and Mercedes and, and Jaguar. So, so, yeah, so let me I, ask I think, you, you know, this. I'll tell you what I you... learned. From... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. Say that again. No, no, no. Go, go, go. May finish your point. I'll tell you what I learned from this, which is really interesting. So what, one of the things that got me interested in this is I'm a, I'm a real car nut, you know, a sports car guy. And, and, and so I just found the whole thing intriguing from that standpoint. I didn't really know anything about the automotive industry before I got involved here and started digging in. And what I learned, which is really interesting, and, and Musk has still never learned this, you know, maybe he's learning it now the hard way, is the easiest thing is to design the cool car. The hardest thing is to build it at scale profitably and with high quality. That's, that's the moat in the auto industry. It takes decades you know, of learning and experience as to how to do that. And even now, some companies are way better at it than others, right? I mean, Toyota builds way better cars than, than Land Rover, right? And they've both been around a long time. That's the moat. And, and that's where Musk you know, discarded decades of manufacturing knowledge and said, oh, I can do it better than all those guys. I'm going to use all robots. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And it was a total disaster, and it's still a disaster for him. So, um, Mark, I noticed the other day that Elon went and borrowed against all of his houses. I guess he put up $100 million bucks of real estate and took out loans against it. The one thing about this guy is that, and, and to his credit, he's, uh, he's not one that doesn't kind of put uh, his money where his mouth is. And I think he was bankrupt before, was he not, when he first started? Uh, like, I think at one point... Uh, Tesla was within a month of not making, like of being bankrupt and not making payroll. So I'm wondering if he's actually closer than we think already. And I'm wondering what kind of what you're thinking in terms of whether this riverboat gambler has done it again. And he's next thing you know, he's going to be bankrupt and have not have a penny to his name again. Well, he admitted uh, that a few months ago, he, Tesla was within a few weeks of, of not making it. He's a very reckless guy. I mean, you know, he owned when he, when he sold, his first company a long time ago, or one of his companies, he went out and spent a million dollars on a McLaren F1, which, which was and is a legendary uh, sports car, and he didn't insure it. And he was driving it with somebody famous in the car with, oh, Peter Thiel, I think. was in, Somebody was in the car, and he totaled the car. Yeah. And he didn't even have insurance on it, right? He's just a reckless guy. I mean, you know, if you read the, the filings, apparently the directors at Tesla who were a bunch of real fucking idiots letting him run wild the way he does, they, they don't have much DNO insurance if you, if you read the filings. So, you know, he's reckless. So to answer your question, look, what? I mean, here's, here's, the, here's the, the, the $50 billion question, right? I mean, why can't a company, you know, with a $300 stock that trades 7, 8 million shares a day go out and just do an overnight deal to raise $2 billion down 10% or wherever it would price in this market. Right. And they haven't. And this, so this seems to tie into real issues, getting a, a registration statement through the sec, which must tie into some heavy duty ongoing investigations that they have not revealed and, and don't want to reveal. That's the only explanation for why they haven't gone out and raised money. Well, and, and, you know, it's clear Musk would rather not, you know, one of the reasons this thing stays where it is, is a relatively restricted float, you know, because Musk owns over 20 percent and, you know, a few other guys own a big chunk. So he'd probably like to to avoid putting more stock out in the market. But it just seems like there's some secret going on here that's stopping them from raising money. So do you think we get that situation where, you know, an SEC and uh, the thing halves overnight or even worse, like goes, you know, we see a 270 tick and then next uh, opening at 50 bucks? Like, do you, right. do you think that's a real possibility? 
Yes. So what I tell people all the time is, I, I think I've, I said it at the beginning of the conversation here, this is going to zero or near zero. I don't know if it gets there fast or if it gets there slow, right? I mean, if they come out and say, yeah, you know, we, we falsified this, that, and this, and now we're coming clean, and then they go out and, and raise a billion and a half at, you know, at 250, you know, maybe they can keep the lights on for an extra year. But the other thing is, you know, then you get into much margin call territory, because as you noted, Musk borrowed a lot of money. I wrote a, a piece for Zero Hedge about this last April, and the best I can determine would be somewhere like in the 230s, he has to either post more stock or start getting sold out by, uh, by Morgan Stanley, who's apparently the, the major lender there. So wow. you know, he can't do an offering. Yeah, so he can't do an offering too low. Now, he does have more stock to, to post, but there's also a, a restriction, that a board restriction that he's not allowed to post more than 25% of his stock. But I guess they would waive that if the alternative was him getting liquidated. But, I mean, who knows? I mean, next week there's a, you know, there's his, his response is due to the SEC for, for, you know, for giving him the middle finger and violating the agreement that he <laughs> did with them, right? This, so, look, no, you know, I've met a lot of great people. I mean, here, look, I run this tiny fund. I've met so many great, well-known people who you guys all know, at least you know their names, you know, f guys famous for shorting stocks, long short guys, pure short guys. And, and, and one of my LPs is a, is a very well-known retired short seller. He actually met me through this thing. And to a man, to a, they're all men, to a man, to a, they say things like, Mark, you know, in 45 years in this business, I've never seen anything like this, you know? And, I'm, and like famous guys you would know tell me they have never seen anything like this ever. I mean, yeah, you would get you would get this on some pink sheet, you know, biotech stock or or you know, or <laughs> Vancouver, what is it, the venture venture exchange Canadian yeah. mining company, you know, no offense guys. <laughs> but but um you don't see this from a company where the CEO is on every magazine cover you know, all the time and, and with this kind of market cap and and you know, CNBC spends an hour a day pumping this, this thing and it's just it's a remarkable situation. That's what people will look back on. You know, we sort of talked about it before, but it's all this stuff is so in plain sight. It's just mind boggling. Yeah. And the biggest question I get from people, you know, it's it's funny because and I've said this before, you know, you'll see like Musk or Musk's mother, who's really I'm sure Musk <laughs> tweeting about, oh, you know, the 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 cabal of, of shorts. You know, they're out to get us. They're talking, they're planning, they're plotting. You know, when I talk to these guys, I'll get phone calls from them, you know, or an email. The only thing I ever get, it's not plotting anything. It's its always a question is, who the fuck is buying this thing, right? That's thats about the only <laughs> thing I hear from these guys is that. And, and I have to tell them, I don't have any idea. And you're the famous short seller. If you don't know, how am I going to know? <laughs> yeah. That's, well, that. That's a great story. Well, thanks for sharing that with us, Mark. So why don't we move on now and we'll go to the uh, tales from the trading desk. And we were wondering at this point if you could share kind of uh, an anecdote or something that our listeners might find amusing from your uh, career on Wall Street. And I guess, you know, before you mentioned that you used to not just run a fund, you used to work uh, for an, emerging, uh, an EM dealer. Is that right? Yeah, so Wall Street was actually a second career for me anyway. I mean, when I got out of college, I worked in commercial real estate for 17 years and then took a year, couple of years off and, and really taught myself finance. I went to work for a, a, a micro cap tech company and, and which turned out to be a, a total nonsensical story stock in itself, you know, it's a scammy company, not in terms of financial scamminess, just in terms of, Oh yeah, this product is going to be great and everybody wants it kind of thing. So that was a fantastic lesson for me in itself. But, then I then I went into into banking on Wall Street. I was actually 42 when I talked myself into my first job, and and basically it was a hybrid of banking and, and equity capital markets. And we would pitch companies on raising money for them, and then go out and do the deals. And one story was an interesting story. This was 2007. Uh, I was at Piper Jaffray, and um, we we're raising company. It was one of these Chinese reverse merger companies, which. We didn't know it at the time, but they pretty much all turned out to be scams, right? But, you know, this one seemed kind of legit and um, and had a pretty good market cap at the time, like north of a billion dollars. It's a company called A-Power. Ticker was APWR. It's, it's not around anymore. I just checked to see if it was even listed. And 
you know, the stock was, I don't know, 28 bucks a share or something like that. And we put together a deal for them at like, you know, $20 and it was a hundred million dollar deal for a company, which we didn't know at the time, but it turned out to be a worthless company, like complete total scam worthless. And wow. somehow word leaked out. Yeah. Somehow word leaked out that this deal was happening and the stock goes down from like, you know, 28 to 22 as the afternoon proceeds. And so we offered this guy $20 a share. He wouldn't take the money, this Chinese guy. You know, it was, it was whatever, six o'clock in New York and 6 a.m. in China. And he's holding out for $22 a share and he absolutely won't take the money. And there's a hundred million on the table. And, you know, thank God he didn't take the money because it turned out that this company was a total fraud. But the amazing thing was, <laughs> The guy knew it was a total fraud. And he has $100 million being put in front of him, and he was fucking greedy. You know, like, you know, like, like, I know my fraud is worth at least 22 a share. It's not worth it. I'm not taking 20 for it. And then, you know, at, at the time, we just thought he was being like an asshole, you know, or, and, and dumb because, hey, the money's here, take it. In hindsight, it was remarkable that a guy running a, a company that was worth zero and went to zero didn't take the hundred million. And it was actually really interesting because, um, you know, it was actually the next morning when, when we finally killed the deal, like, you know, we were up all night with him. Some of the guys were trying to convince him, you know, it was morning for him. And I'll never forget, like the stock opened, I'm, I'm making up a number here, but the stock opened at, let's say $18 because that's what the word is. And you know, that cause word had gotten out about a deal. Nobody knows knew where it was. Around 10 a.m., we put this press release on the wire. It was fascinating. Like the, the press release it's attendant was amazing. You know, that like we just we were thinking about raising money. We've decided not to raise any money. We don't need any money. It's amazing to just watch the stick up stock up. And, and again, I'm making up the numbers here, but 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, just like as soon as the press release hits, it, it was kind of an amazing and, and you could see it where, where Musk gets this tweeting going back full circle to Tesla. It was an amazing feeling of power that that you put this on the wire and the stock instantly ticks up $10 on it, you know? So, so, yeah. so that was one that just this fraud would not take the money. The other, the other one, a quick one, I'll tell you, this is when I had my fund, you know, I was long a, and it's still around a, a micro cap, really nano cap, um, a biotech company called pain therapeutics, PTIE. And, you know, they had this drug, which was basically, you know, their version of Oxycontin and it was a tamper proof, uh, formula. So like, you know, you couldn't chew it and get high. And for years and years, they just couldn't get it approved, but they had this deal with Pfizer and Pfizer was going to get it approved. So I had bought a lot of this, you know, like not a lot in dollars, but I had probably 4% of the company, I think in the twos, because I figured, you know, this is a lot. Ah, Pfizer is going to get this approved. And I was, I was visiting my dad actually in Arizona one night and there's a, a late night Bloomberg story that hits that, that some company um, was it Bayer? I forget. Some German company had patents on tamper-proof, you know, Oxycontin. And Oxycontin is a brand name, but tamper-proof, whatever that drug is. And and they lost the patent lawsuit. Like the judge said, you know, you can't patent this tamper-proofness. It's you know, it's um, it, it's it's too, too much in the common domain or whatever the, the term is. And I see that, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm fucked. Because, and by the way, the stock was up 50% from where I bought it. I bought it like in the twos. I think it was now in the threes. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm fucked. Nobody's going to pay pain therapeutics you know, for its tamper-proof technology if it's public domain. You know, it, Even if it's a different way of doing it, why pay these guys a royalty if, if, if anyone can do it now? So I call up my friend, uh, Jeff, who was a sharp guy who worked for a very sharp uh, biotech uh, short-selling fund. And I said, Jeff, I'm so fucked. What am I going to do? This, this was probably like 2012 or 13, something like that. He's like, Mark, Mark, relax. We're in the biggest fucking biotech <laughs> bubble in history. The idiots out there will have no idea what this means. Don't worry. You'll have plenty of time to get out of it. And sure enough, the next day, I sold up my whole position, which was, again, probably 4% of the company. I don't know if I moved the stock 20 cents, you know, from 350 to 370 or something, uh, 370 to 300, something like that. And and, and there was no reaction at all. And then, the, and then the next day it recovered right back up to where it was. And I'm like, fuck, now I can short this thing. And I did. And it still took probably another, I don't know, week and a half before the stock collapsed when people finally realized like, oh my God, there wow. was this patent thing like three weeks ago. <laughs> you know? Today, 
I would just put it on Twitter. I just wasn't on act. I wasn't active on Twitter then. You know, today I'd be like, uh, <laughs> yeah. "Hey guys, uh, long this. You might want to read this lawsuit and ask yourself who's going to buy this thing." You know. By the way, the company was still trying to get this approved five or six years later, and it got rejected again in in uh, in, in last fall of eight, 2018. And I just haven't defaulted the price release, so they finally gave up and uh, and switched over to something much much easier to cure, which is uh, Alzheimer's. <laughs> 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 it's just, it's just Mark. It just goes to show you that that you know the, all those guys that go to school and they do a random walk down Wall Street. They they get yeah. Professor Malkiel's book and they and they try to tell you the markets are efficient and and I sit there and just laugh at them. And there's so many stories like that that just kind of makes me shake my head and wonder what these guys are smoking when they tell me that the markets are efficient. Because well, so uh, you know, it, there you it, go. It took yeah. So so the. The, the micro cap nano cap market is particularly inefficient. And, um, and that's why, you know, I have this little fund and I can buy things there. I'm, I'm really, I mean, besides this shorting Tesla stuff, I'm really a deep value guy. I'm a very patient guy. And, you know, I can buy companies there where like, if I went to one of my sort of deep value heroes, like a David Einhorn or somebody like that and said, David, you should look at this. He'd be like, Mark, no, that's a no brainer, but I can't touch that. I'm running $6 billion or whatever he's running these days. And, and that's a really inefficient thing. Now, the, the, the flip side of that is it just doesn't scale. You know, I could never run more than $100 million in that strategy buying, you know, co a concentrated portfolio of 35 and $40 million market cap companies, right? But that's really inefficient. But here's another example of inefficiency, and, and, and it goes back to Tesla. There were a couple of, of stories, and this is amazing inefficiency, actually. So... When Tesla's chief general counsel, the new one, this guy, Botswakis or whatever his name is, you know, when he quit, it, I, it was pre-market maybe two, three weeks ago, something like that. I'm sure you guys saw that. And I saw the story on Dow Jones, right? And Dow Jones Wire, that's what I have. I don't have a Bloomberg term. I have Dow Jones and, and Reuters and some other stuff. Dow Jones ran this story and the stock did nothing for like three minutes until Bloomberg ran the story. And then the stock collapsed, like it traded off $8 or $10, right? And the same thing happened two weeks ago. I forget what it is now, but somebody else ran the story and the stock did nothing for like 12 minutes or whatever it was until Bloomberg ran the headline. I mean, that's unbelievable inefficiency that a Dow, jo Dow Jones can run the story, but all the algos are only looking at Bloomberg. That's right, because you know? the that algos, be it's, it's, easy to, it's easy to program it on the Bloomberg. That's why. And so they're all just looking at that. So, uh, you know, Mark, we're going to cut you off there because we're going to go on. But listen, stick around the after hours with Mark. We're going to go through some of his longs and find out, you know, all these kind of other inefficiencies that he's taking advantage of. So please, Mark, can you stick around with us? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Kevin, it's time for This Week in Trading History. And, I mean, we were debating doing even two pieces because you wanted to do Palm, right? Yeah, the, uh, this, originally. this week, uh, way back when in 1999, Palm came uh, public with the, this, this crazy market cap. Um, it was going to be a good story, but then I saw how much this next story, how dear it was to your heart. Oh, and I just said, Jesus. you know what? I'm going to let Patrick do it. So why don't you take it away and give well, us this uh, this week in trading history? You know what? Well, listen, I'm a trader and I love charts. And there was something special about uh, March 6th of 2009 uh, when the S&P 500 on the uh, cash index hit 666. It's like the devil's the number, number of the beast. Yeah, the number of the beast. Number of the beast. And, um, and well, you know what? Uh, the late Mark uh, Haynes uh, actually called the bottom. Now, the, just to give context, I want to play this video uh, just to, to tribute to him. But uh, he, uh, he made that call on March 10th. But to give everyone a little bit of context before we watch it uh, was that on uh, March 6th was the actual lowest price print. Uh, if I show you here on the chart... Uh, that was that the bottom of this little uh, shadowed candle here, but it was actually at the bottom of the green candle uh, on uh, March 10th that this video was where it was like the selling was intense, the market was starting with uh, with a strong open, and that's when Mark made the call. Let's watch the video. 
And I know we always say that money on the sidelines doesn't necessarily mean it's all going to go back in because people have been burnt. But even if, say, even a small fraction of what people think goes back in, it would probably at least give you a little bounce. I've been hearing the money on the sidelines argument for 20 years. Yeah. There's a trillion dollars on the sidelines. There's two trillion dollars on the... There's five trillion dollars. <laughs> I mean, that's money that's not coming back in. Right. However, I'm going to step out on a limb here. Uh, this I is really, the big... Hold on, I, everyone. We've been I, waiting I for this. I think we're at the bottom. I really do. And this is because, this isn't just your opinion, you've done uh, I, According to my research, the, 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 the key to me is the 200-day moving average of the Dow. Yes. And we are now at 67% of the 200-day moving average. Now, it's gotten lower than that. It's been in the 30s, it got down to 50%, half of the 200-day moving average. But 67% of the 200-day moving average is a real nice place to get a bounce. So I think we're going to have a rally. There we go. Man unafraid to make a call. And, and well, hey, I don't Mark, know whether it's going to be a bear tell market this, rally, but I think, at in least, other words, I think today this is for real. Look at this 187. Yeah, Let me this just say is for this. Real. As far as I'm concerned, even if it dies tomorrow, Mark's call was right because he did get a rally for one day. That's the kind of loyal sidekick now, I am. I, 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 I think it's going to carry. I think it's going to have legs. And we all, we all hope it does. So that was the Mark Haynes well, yeah. bottom. Mark is the one I want to give kudos to here. Obviously, one of the most cynical. Uh, CNBC commentators ever, wouldn't you think? Oh yeah, he was. Uh, he's an ex-lawyer, if I remember right, and or he wasn't. Yeah, ex- and he called everyone's bullshit. Yeah, and he he was he just there was no no one that couldn't come on that air without him. Like, he, I like I I I'm sh- surprised he hasn't been f bombing on that show. Yeah, he was like your would, your like a uh, like your uh, your kind of grumpy old grandpa that would just be there and yeah. he, nothing was ever good enough. But he. Uh, Finally, after, you know, that relentless selling, and that's the part that everyone uh, don't, doesn't realize is that there was lots of people calling bottoms the whole way down. And uh, it was, it, we'd hit this point where I, I still remember that period where it just seemed like there was no bottom in sight. And, and obviously that's when, when things look the bleakest is obviously when it turned, right? And that's... Uh, and isn't it interesting that he used uh, some of the... Uh, the squiggles to justify uh, where he thought the bo- why the bottom was coming in. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, you know, some guys get lucky every now and then, I guess, with the squiggles. <laughs> 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 but with that said, you know what? What a, it just uh, uh, to me it was important because to reflect back. I mean, we're at the top of some sort of a business cycle, and and by no means. By no means does um, some sort of a downturn here have to escalate to a 2008 to 2009 kind of uh, downturn in the economy. It could, but it doesn't have to. Uh, but boy, was that something. Yeah. When when that uh, when that bear market ripped on the downside, I mean the total length uh, of the bear market on this chart we're showing here, the the whole thing lasted. Uh, uh, what do we have here? Three hundred five hundred and seventeen days. Yeah. Right. Uh, so like three. Uh, let, let's call it a year and a half, eighteen months or something like that. And uh, and it was it was a bloodbath. There were like some of those banks were literally five cents on the dollar. Yeah. Uh, at 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 the at the end of that, and it was an epic buying opportunity. But it what I think the most important thing for me from a reflection is recognizing that these massive business cycles play out, right? And you have, and you have these big periods where uh, the market is at the peak, and everyone wants to own everything, and valuations don't matter. And then it's at the bottom, and you can't uh, give away the stock. Right, and so you know, where do you it, think we are now, Patrick? Well, we're a late business cycle, yeah. so we're we're at the top of. I just, the, of you know, that. it's funny because now it seems so obvious in hindsight. Oh, you know, six six six, you should have bought it. It was so cheap, and I remember even President Obama said something to the effect that uh, you know stocks are cheap and it might be a good time to buy some uh, some equities, and everyone laughed at him. They it, and and it was for many years during this whole rally. There was hedge funds shorting it, telling us how we were going to go back down to that number. And we've just been screaming higher ever since. And it's it's ironic how now it's almost the exact same situation in reverse. Whereas before, yeah. no one wanted to own equities. It's now to the point where everyone wants to own equities. And it's just going to continue forever and ever and ever. You know, there's lots of kind of uh, permables that are just laughing at anyone who kind of advocates taking some risk off the table. You can't time markets, blah, blah, blah. Passive. There's no sense trying to pick stocks. All this stuff. 
And it just, it, to me, it's full it, circle. It's yeah, it's full completely circle. the opposite uh, situation. And so it's a good pick for the, uh, this week in trading history. Cause I think that, uh, we might look back and it might be the, uh, the opposite time uh, this week. So let's, uh, let's move on. Kev, you put together what I, I like, I, I had to watch it three times. I was laughing so hard. Uh, you put together a fabulous WTF clip of the week. Uh, any anything you want to quickly say before we run it, or you just want to run? Well, it? you know, I'm still trying to make uh, you know make back all the the kind of the <laughs> negative hate mail I got from my dark one. I made that one dark one where I went down this road that wasn't as much funny. Well, it was kind of maybe a little bit dark humor. So I'm trying to keep them a little bit more upbeat. And uh, <laughs> let's see what you think. Let's play it. My mission is simple: to make you money. Yeah, so. Oh, he's acting very strangely. I think he started drinking again. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Come on. Okay, well, what am I drinking? What do you got? This is ridiculous. Canada got some good news about the trade talks with China. And after initially erupting higher, the averages sold off and then they sold off dramatically. Dow closing down 207 points, SB sinking 0.39%, NASDAQ losing 0.23%. Although all these indices were down much, much more intraday, particularly the Nasdaq. It was an unsettling reminder that stocks remain fragile and the asset class simply is not capable of handling severe selling all at once, which is the case. That is damn good scotch. <laughs> I gotta do a commercial for this stuff. Mmm. <laughs> Boy, that Hennigan goes down smooth. <laughs> and afterwards, you don't even smell. <laughs> That's right, folks. I just had three shots of Hennigan's and I don't smell. And therefore, it's almost entirely machine driven. Why do I think it's machines doing the selling? Because the action today had nothing to do with trying to find the right price or the best price. The machines just went out and they're not price sensitive at all. That's the opposite of what actual humans do when they work orders to get a better than the average price at the end of the day. If it were actual humans doing the selling, they would instruct their brokers to find buyers first. They would walk away if there are none to be found. They'd let the bids build so the stock goes higher without them. And that's not what happened midday. Instead, we had multiple sellers that didn't give a darn about price. They didn't give it a second thought, which is a classic sign that these decisions are being made by algorithms, not by people. So <laughs> Imagine, you can walk around drunk all day. That's Hennigan's. No smell, no tell. Scotch. Look, don't get me wrong. In Friday night's game plan, I very specifically warned you to expect turbulence this week ahead of the jobs data. Remember, that report comes out Friday. I don't object to the fact that we went down today. And a lot of people say, oh, Kramer, you're just a bull. No, I don't mind that we went down one bit. I object to how we went down. Say you got a big job interview and you're a little nervous. Well, throw back a couple of shots of Hennigan's and you'll be as loose as a goose and ready to roll in no time. And because it's odorless, why, it'll be our little secret. The speed of vicious velocity that freaks people out and calls it into question once again whether this asset class is even worth owning. The house of pain. Can it be trusted? What makes me so certain this selling was mindless? Simple. I don't hear a single, I didn't, not all day, that I hear a single cogent explanation for the massive, relentless selling. Sell, 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 sell. That engulfed the averages a little afternoon today. Selling the. A T double N R. Kramer. Yeah, that'll do. You know, after after drinking uh, half of this extremist beer, I'm I'm feeling pretty loosey goosey myself here. <laughs> Uh, you know, and I just I, I kind of laughed when I saw Kramer complaining about the mar these algos driving down the market. Can you pull up a long term chart like we just spoke about it in terms of this bull market since that 2009 low or, or yeah, 2009. You want a weekly chart yeah. like you want a big, big. Yeah. Future? So let's 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 look at what Kramer's getting upset about. Look at it. It's it's so it's this tiny little amount. Like, what is that guy smoking or like, or I guess, what is he drinking? Because the guy is, he's kind of lost it in my book when he starts complaining about the market going down, not only from a bigger perspective, like in terms of multi years, but even in terms of a monthly or a weekly perspective, we're 20% off the low and the thing goes down 2% and he starts screaming about the machines. 
the machine selling. Like, give me a break. Yeah. You know what? Like, the, the stock market has to go down just as often as it goes up in some degree or another. Now, maybe not equal amount of time, but what the, the market is, is a self-correcting mechanism all the time, kind of overshooting and then undershooting, and the mean price is sort of in the middle, and, and, and this price discovery is happening all the time. And this idea that anybody who is selling – uh, that causes the stock to go down is is, is like nonsensical yeah. or, or irrational is almost what I got from him trying to explain and this is all the algos. Yeah. It, it's just silly. It's dumb. Like, listen, I'll tell you one thing. I do agree with him that the, that the world has changed in that I believe that portfolio managers make a decision on the day and then they put in orders that are VWAP or TWAP, meaning that they're averaged out throughout the day. So I think the market has become less responsive to daily news. And I think that also it, it doesn't matter if the stock market is down 1%, they keep selling. It's not like the, the, the portfolio manager mirror says, I want to sell today and I'm only going to sell if it's at 1% or, you know, higher down 1% or right. higher. They just say, I'm going to sell it today. And I've seen this time and time again where it seems to be that the market doesn't react until the next day to the actual news. But this happens on the upside just as much as it happens to the downside. And in fact, if you look at it over the last 10 years, it's happened way more to the upside. So Kramer is just like, this was just ridiculous. I think he embarrassed himself with this kind of, uh, kind of talk. And I think he should just go back to drinking his scotch what? and, uh, and, and <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what I, what, what I'm shocked is it took us till episode 18 for Kramer to make his first appearance on uh, on the huddle. Is that true? I, the I have, we haven't had him yet. I didn't. I thought, or have we? I thought we might have, but you know what? Maybe I'm. Maybe you're right. Well, maybe I'll make up for it. No, I'll uh, do some know, more. Well, we, now you know we we have to dig this up because he he's uh, he's got plenty of material for us. Yeah. No, you're right. <laughs> so we'll 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 pull some from the vault. Don't worry, Jim. If you're listening, we're gonna get you on again. All right. <laughs> Okay, let's move on. Kev, time for the top five things to watch next week. But before we do, we have to review last week's top five. And one disclaimer, it is Thursday evening. So we didn't get the employment numbers yet. So number one scratched off. We just, we're still going to find out what happens here. They didn't, the numbers didn't happen, right? That's right. So uh, we had to do it different uh, because you're once again going away for the weekend. But at least this time you're taking your family. So uh, Mrs. Uh, Big Picture Trading isn't going to lock you out of the house. <laughs> All right. So let's start with number five. Uh, we have uh, obviously the, uh, the um, uh, index over there in, in South Korea. And uh, and so Actually, let me see if I can dig this up it, over it's, here. It's but, still uh, trading heavy, man. Like it's, uh, you know, even while China is flying to the upside and other emerging markets, uh, you know, are doing okay, the Cosby is just, it's trading down. And it's, uh, I don't know if it's the yeah, Trump uh, effect or what, what it is, but ever since that uh, t tagging that 200-day squiggle, it tagged that and it's been down every day. Yeah. You know, the um, the one thing from the way I, I approach trading is is that this isn't enough selling for me to already put the nails in the coffin. If, uh, if I mean, if, if this thing stays, let's say, legitimately above 2100 um, and the whole uh, and let's say the whole emerging market space kind of rolls back up and goes, this thing could still have one more push higher. I'm not ready to already start being bearish on it, but it has not recovered since we brought it up. Yeah. So that's definitely noteworthy. Right. Uh, so number four, we were talking about bond yields and uh, and it was a pop and drop. Oh. It was like I a prairie dog, like, prairie do dog, prairie. Thank you. It's a noble animal. Thank you. Uh, it's a noble animal. But what was interesting is, is that, uh, you know, when we look at the two year yield, I want to go at the shorter end because we were talking, I think, the 10 and tens and more. But like that completely reversed. When you look at the even the two year treasury bond, the reciprocal, it looks like it's breaking bullishly breaking out. Yeah. Like the I, I've often found that uh bonds don't trend well and they're and they're prone to these sorts of uh, kind of pop and drops and and moves that quickly get retraced and stuff. They're just not a good trend. It's not like a currency. 
So, I, you know, that's one of the reasons that I'm a little less inclined to go with breakouts. You know what? I, I actually will disagree with you. Oh. I've actually seen some nice trends develop that were tr totally tradable. I like trading bonds, to be honest. It, uh, and okay, well, there, and yeah. I've had success in that. So so it's not uh, like I don't want to like shit on you, but like I'm j I like trading but bonds. But you will. Uh, they, <laughs> But I will take the opportunity to shut on your show. Okay. Anyway, let's move on to Canada because that th there's some interesting stuff going on. Now, first of all, it was not in the Canadian TSX that the really interesting thing's happening, right? Like the Canadian TSX is actually kind of pinned compared to what's going on. We can kind of mix this with the BOC, uh, the Bank of Canada, number two. But really, so far... The Canadian TSX is kind of muddled up along the top end, right? Uh, this is not where the where the big move is. Yeah, and actually, interestingly what? enough, even though the S and P has had a week of down uh, kind of move, like like we're doing, we're taping this Thursday night, uh, we've had like four day, down days in a row or something like that, and uh, the TSX has actually outperformed on a weekly basis and is much more above its two hundred day moving average than the S and P. Uh, so now where, where I will push back at you is, is that when you look at the MSCI Canada ETF, which is in price in us dollars, the pullback, uh, is distinct, which is really the fact that the Canadian dollar shit to bed. It kind of acted as a buoyancy that's held up the index. And more importantly, in my opinion, that, um, because the Canadian index looked like that chart just looks parabolic, right? Like in terms of its rise, but on a percentage basis, the uh, the uh, Canadian TSX bounce on the upside was actually less than that of the S and P. It's only sixteen percent rise, while the S and P rose over twenty. Okay, well I'll give you that. So, I'll give you that it didn't rise as much. But this idea percentage wise, that, that's right. But this idea that we have to put everything into U.S. dollars, it's, I call BS on that. Like the oh, listen. Yeah. All I'm saying is the fact that the Canadian dollar is going down is actually helping the stock market. Yeah, but if you're you know a, a futures trader that's trading, uh, you know, can, yes, there you're right. Yeah. You're right on that. But I'm just saying that when when the Canadian dollar shits to bed, it's not go, uh, that actually is a a, a bit of a, a tailwind to the stock market. It kind of holds it but, up, but that's everywhere. That's in Australia. Yeah, like, like yeah, that's everywhere. That's everywhere. That's like uh, you know, interestingly enough, pull up the Australian stock market. Even though the Australian economy is doing terrible, it's actually doing the Australian stock market's actually doing really well. I was going through right. my charts the other and, day. Right, but but what is the but the Australian once again the Australian dollar has been. Hold on, let me put up the equity market here. But the Australian dollar has. Uh, also been very weak oh, right I, and so the uh, the, the asx uh, asx has been ripping all like, yeah the fuck i, I i'm not so disagreeing with you i'm just saying that this idea that we have to put everything into us dollars is just i i don't buy it i i look at things in the nominal currency of that they trade in and that's what i'm I, i'm playing for yeah like look at this chart on the yeah. asx like that, it's almost back to, to testing its highs. Crazy advance. I actually think it's a short. I listen. Are you, would, I don't disagree with you there. Like I'm not. I'm not going to take the other side of the trade. But let's go back to Canada though, because that was a that was what was in our yeah. top five. Um, so so first of all, look at the Canadian dollar break. Yeah, it's uh, like that, that. That now that was driven by the Bank of Canada, right? Well, I mean, it they, was it was they, driven by bad economic numbers out of Canada, which was then confirmed by the Bank of Canada. So let's go Thank through you. And, and you can see that the, I actually have a chart that shows you go to the next slide there. You can see that all the numbers for the past week out of Canada have been terrible. You know, quarterly GDP expecting one comes out at uh, 0.4. The, uh, the month over month down 0.1 instead of even. You know, the market is 52. The ISM is 52.6. And like that's close to the IV purchasing managers, which is like our ISM manufacturing survey is 50.6. We're just 0.6 away from the economy actually contracting. Yeah. It's it's right. it's bad. And, and you can see that in terms of this next chart uh, that you can pull up, which I did the Canadian U.S. 10 year yield spread. And you'll see that the Canadian bonds are now yielding almost 90 basis points less than the U.S. bonds. Like that's a big that's a big difference. 
10 years. Like, well, and, and for our listeners, they should know that there's been, a, a, at least from what I've noticed, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I've noticed a pretty consistent correlation between interest rates in the Canada and the U.S. They're not the same, but they generally trend the same. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? Like, we're, uh, we're, we're attached to the hip, and we trade together a lot. Um, but this is telling on, you— On these different— this is telling you that Canada is 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 slowing down, slowing down hard, especially versus the U.S., and that we're in some trouble. Like, uh, you know, the global malaise that that has been uh, that is most other countries have been experiencing finally hit Canada. The real question I have is: Is the U.S. immune to it, or are they just going to be the last ones? To have it. Oh, they're totally going to be the last ones. Uh, um, My entire narrative at Big Picture Trading is the fact that this is the reciprocal of 2007 through 2009, which is that in 2007, 2009, the problem started subprime, became a U.S. problem, and like a contagion, it spread to the rest of the world. And the U.S. was the first problem, and it dragged the rest of the world down with it. I think that this is the reciprocal. This time, the whole world shits to bed and grabs the U.S. by the ankles and drags it down. But the U.S. will be the last one standing, and they're going to be—they're going to hold up longer. But eventually, they will succumb. Uh, yeah, but they, but they will be the strongest one for the long time. Well, there you go. You, uh, like, a, yeah, you—you you obviously have a view on that. Um, I don't know if. Uh, like imagine if we bounce from here what happens if we get a global bounce does the us underperform i don't think we're going to have a global bounce okay. i mean look uh, look i'm uh, anything can happen i have to admit that listen what i believe generally is that you ha- you have to build a narrative and you got to stress test your narrative and if something different is happening we have to rethink it but right now the global economic slowdown is underway and there's and there's no sign that there's a big new growth cycle starting globally right now. Yeah. Well, I tend to agree with you and I think that uh, US 10 years could be one of the best and, and you know me, I'm a big bond bear over the long term. But I, I'm actually warming up to the long side of the bond market, which means you. But should. you're saying ten. I you were a five. You were a twos and fives. Yeah, guy. so you're I was a twos and fives guy, and I actually think that that for a little while you can go out a little further because I think that the Fed is going to be slow to cut, and if we do get a rollover, you're going to be better off at the longer end of the curve because what's going to happen is the curve's going to invert. So this is like a, oh, this is like it. a, I love yeah. it. This is music to my ears. Yeah, uh, you know this is I, music to my. I ears. hate myself for like being kind of like leaning on the long side of the U.S. bond market, but that is what join I, join the dark side yeah. with me. Well, buddy. it's it's yeah. listen, it's just for a trade. It's not for an investment. <laughs> and like I, you you. Well, I'm gonna come. I don't know what you define as an investment, but I I'm playing the. Uh, a time frame of like the the business cycle turn. So I'm like looking for something that's like one year out. Like I'm not I'm not bullish bonds for a five year time horizon, right? Like uh, to me, this is this is also a trade, but it's not a day trade or even a short term swing trade. Like I think I think that this is a legitimate trade of 2019. So I think that if you get what you're expecting in terms of the U.S. economy finally succumbing to the global slowdown, then I think that the U.S. tens will definitely be a great trade i could see those uh you know the yield going from 263 all the way down to two or something like that i'm not like a raul paul bullish where he thinks that we're going to go to new lows or whatever oh, dude we're the, we're going lower than two i'll 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 i'll, I'll, I'll i'm maybe i listen okay. i don't know well, whether there we go. we're going to see a 10 tenu- that's awesome there's their bet Okay, I think there's no way we're going below two absent of like a nuclear. Oh, I'll take war. that day. Yeah. I'll take that yeah. tra- bet against you any day. Okay, the, uh, we're going under two. We're going under two. I feel I. I'll take that. Okay, what, you want to? Is, is this a Duke and Duke, or it, are we going to put real no, money no, on the Duke line? No, no, it's a Duke and Duke. Of course, it's a Duke and Duke. <laughs> so what we're going to do? I'm losing track of all of our Duke and Dukes. Okay, we, we, like every. So this is every the thing. four shows. So listen, this is what we'll bet. We'll bet. I'll say that during the next economic downturn. The ten year won't go below. Oh, geez, two feels like. Just not, say two. No, but two. Let me look at this. Let me make sure. Okay, I'll say two. I'm gonna. I'm gonna stick right. to it. 
I know that's bold. Uh, and and I'm I and I and I am not even going to claim victory if it's like a a 1.99. I'm uh, it's going legitimately below two in my opinion. Okay. And so 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 like I'm not uh, I'm not going to be splitting hairs over um, over a couple points. Okay. You know, you got the two in area. Sounds All good, right? man. Because well, I think it stops there. Okay. Basically, is what my what my belief is. So, so what I wanted to show on this chart over here, look at that steepener on the five thirties in Canada. That we are blowing right out. And I wanted to ask you: Is that an indication in your mind that the recession in Canada is coming faster than the U.S.? We, um, yes. So it, it means that they also expect that the Canadian Bank of Canada will be more accommodative than the than the Fed was, and I think we're already seeing that. Don't forget that the yeah. the, the the Fed I think will. Be, but the numbers are, the numbers are weaker in Canada, so the Bank of Canada has to be far more ahead of this. Yeah, but I still think that uh, even relative to the like the kind of equivalent numbers, I think the Bank of Canada will be more dovish. And not only that, let's face it. We have a housing problem, and that when this thing finally turns and starts to go down, it's going to be uglier than the states. Our recession will be worse than the American recession, without a doubt. What? What? Oh my God! You are now flip flopping. No, no, no dude. I, I remember you coming on to Macro Voices, and we had this debate. No, no, we had, the, and you were trying to. You, oh my God! You were totally like this is going to be benign. No, I and said. I said. Money. Don't forget, I was fading <laughs> the hedge fund guys who said this is the end of the world. We're going to have a 2008 Steve Carell type, you know, like strippers taking out four right, houses and, so, and so, stuff but, like that. So then, then please redefine to me what you think uh, is going to be ugly here, because you just I, made I didn't a say ugly. Right I here. said that our recession, the Canadian recession, will be deeper. Than the American recession, I suspect okay, that okay. we're gonna. So that, okay, I'm putting words yeah. in your mouth. So I suspect that the American recession that's coming up at the end of this business cycle will actually be quite muted, and I am quite bullish on the fact that I don't think that we're having anywhere close to a 2008 style kind of collapse, and I think that the surprise will sure. be how shallow the next recession is in the states. That's what I think. So, hmm. and I just, I, and, and, and relative, Canada is going to do worse as we go through the next recession because we have more debt. You know, there's more, you know, it kind of uh, capital, uh, let's just say, um, uh, huh. uh, like kind of like misallocations of capital over the past, you know, decade in yeah. terms of our uh, real estate market taking off. It's going to, it's going to hurt more. So, and, and I right. still hold the belief that, that the vast majority of any real pain in the Canadian economy will will be experienced through a depreciation of the currency. So I'm not going back on what yeah, I said. Yeah, I'll voices. agree with that. Like, I'll, you know what? I'll, I'll agree with that. No, 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 listen. I'm good. Okay. I'm good. You know what? You're right. Canadian dollar is going to take the hit of it. I, I'll agree with that one. Okay. And that's going to be the same for Australia too. Uh, and – uh, so this is why your Australia Canada thing may not be as profitable. I think you're right though. The Aussie should be on balance weaker than Canada, but uh, but I still think a, a pure play against the dollar is a better way. To yeah, play listen, it. no doubt uh, the Australian dollar looks like shit. Like there's no doubt in my mind that like a straight out right. If you're bearish on uh, kind of currencies, then shorting the Australian dollar is probably the best bet. I just hate the fact that the U.S. dollar ends up having all these political overturns. You know, overture like like there's there's so much going on that can be not related to that specific trade. So for me, I would rather have more short Australia CAD than just like the equivalent amount of Australia USD. And I, it's just how the, okay. the way I like it. It's just a pure trade. Right. Anyways, that's me. So listen, just uh, let's move on. Number two, just uh, here, uh, Bank of England and ECB. We talked about the Bank of Canada. Uh, but now we're going to talk more about the ECB and the euro in just a moment. But there was uh, there was one chart you wanted to talk about uh, on what's going on in here uh, with Europe. So what's your thinking first? Well, today we had the ECB and I guess there's the TLTROs or whatever they are. Yeah. And uh Draghi's showing that he's going to continue doing more of the same and nothing's changing, but the um, European financials just, it was a bloodbath. 
They just hated it. It was mm-hmm. down four percent. You can see the chart there. It just as soon as Draghi started speaking, Deutsche Bank got hit, Credit Suisse got hit, Barclays got hit. Like you name it, European banks freaking hated it. Yeah. And you know what's crazy is just how shit those charts look. You know what? Uh, I, I you know what? I have to ask you about um, you know see in Canada, Canadians love their Canadian banks. Right, you know, it's, and, it's kind of funny actually. They, it's almost it's a, an oligopoly that they overcharge us for, but we all make up for it by owning all the stock. <laughs> yeah, and and that's perfectly fine by that. But uh, you know, I I want to look back and ask the question like, take something like Credit Suisse, which is not Deutsche Bank, but it might as well be when you look at this chart. That's awful. Like anyone who spent. The last 12 years as an investor in this stock uh, might as well grab a bucket and puke. Yeah, these uh, stocks are now trading like warrants because there's so much debt on these things. And the reality is that, um, you know, a a slip into kind of a deflationary collapse and these things are gone. So just very quickly for our for our listeners that are listening to the podcast, I'm showing here Credit Suisse. And it was trading at seventy-five dollars back in two thousand and seven, and it's trading at twelve bucks today. It was as low as ten. So you know, uh, for for twelve years, this thing has been in a straight line uh, from uh, uh, the top left to the bottom right. Yeah. And what's most right? interesting so is that in two thousand and eight, it went back. It went down to you know eighteen, nineteen bucks or whatever it was, and it rallied back up to fifty. And the American banks have done the same, but they've continued going, whereas all these European banks have rolled all over and given up all their gains that they got post the 2009 kind of recovery and have now gone on to new lows. And that's what's most disconcerting. You know what? Uh, So in your mind. Is this going to be a double bottom on Credit Suisse at the ten, or are we going to single digits? On I the don't stock? know. Like, listen, I've given up these um, these Europeans. Um, <laughs> the fact that they keep trying to think and they can solve their problems with easy monetary policy with no fiscal, you know, kind of stimulus is is insane. And let's let's stop and think for a second of what America, because America is doing really well these days. What are they doing? Well, they have a relatively uh, kind of tight monetary policy with relatively loose fiscal policy. So maybe the Europeans should kind of have a look and everyone's going to listen. I'm going to get all these people screaming at me. There's too much debt. Oh, for sure. They will. Yeah, Yeah. All this crap. But well, all I can say is that the the status quo ain't working. And all you're doing is is kind of increasing the debt at, at no, you know, while you leave rates at zero and, and, and at negative. The idea that rates are negative in Europe is just in asinine. And the fact that the Europeans haven't woken up to this and said, listen, we made this experiment into your negative rates. It was a mistake. We got to figure out how to get a, you know, get it back. It's just, it's, it's, it just kind of boggles my mind. And the fact that like the, 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 the banks are reacting this way is not surprising because more of the same, meaning more easy money is not going to solve the problem. And I'm not trying yeah. to say that we need they need rates to go up to 2% or anything, but I'm saying that negative rates do not work. And this right. like it just it has to change and and the I think the scary thing is it's showing no signs of changing. No, no, no. They, they it, it's it, they're not going to change anytime soon. This is more of the same. There's too much bureaucracy uh bureaucracy. Yeah, I can't even say the word. But uh, uh the, there's just too much there with Brussels, yeah. they, they, it's not. It's too. It's too it, hard. It's basically to like Japan. Japan struggled with this for a decade until finally Abenomics came around, and it was basically a. Uh, it was a disaster from the uh, from the uh, the big wave. I can't remember what it's called. Anyways, it was that. It was. It was. It took a kind of a crisis for them to finally wake up to the fact that something needed to change, and maybe it's going to be the same in Europe. Yeah. All right. Let's move on, Kev. So let's go to the top five things to watch next week. Finally, what everyone waits for. And so let's hit what number five is for us to watch. And so I wanted to talk about the U.S. financials. So here we were shitting on European financials for a bit. But let's be realistic. 
the U.S. financials have been pretty much the worst performing major sector uh, in the last one month. Just looking at the month of February, uh, they, um, uh, the XLF, now, yes, the XLF did, like the fi U.S. financials did, uh, have a very strong rebound off the first dump. But really, after that first pop that occurred in the first few weeks of January, the financials could not find a bid. And this is not doing justice. You go right across the board, investment banks, uh, whether Goldman or Morgan Stanley, look like shit. You go to the major money center banks, more, uh, you know, Wells Fargo, uh, JP Morgan, even the momentum in City and, and Bank of America, these stocks, just nothing is happening here. Now, the question I have for you, is there one push? Have they just been laggards and they're going to catch up to the rest of the market here with a pop? Or is this sort of the canary in the coal mines that this is uh, this bear market rally and that financials are the weakest piece of shit uh, stuff out there and they're the ones that are going to take the blunt of the hit in the next go around? What's your thinking? I don't know, Patrick. I'll tell you, as you were kind of going on about this, I was thinking about, I had a, a, a kind of a conversation with a Bloomberg reporter today. And he was uh, quizzing me on my MMT article. And in my MMT article, I said something to the effect that you want to own real assets and you want to sell financial assets if we get a move towards MMT. And he was asking me what that meant and kind of we were going through it all. And I, you know, I went back and forth. And I kind of, as you were telling me how badly these financials have performed, I, I kind of wondered to myself, maybe this is the market figuring out that the next move isn't in financial assets, but it's in real assets. And, and maybe it doesn't have to be that financials lead a good bull market. Maybe we can get a, 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 a change in leadership. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. I'm not saying it for sure. Yeah. I listen. My 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 contention is is that the whole point uh, of at this stage when we're in late business cycle, and we're turning. It's it's an actual lack of liquidity, and it's hard for even real assets to catch the bid. I I what where I think that you're going to be right is going to be that once the central banks have to start injecting liquidity because they're realizing everything's gone to shit. Real assets will be the ones that will do the best in that environment. Well, so so I just so I don't think I I sorry, I want to interrupt there for go. a second because I don't think the next um, kind of crisis will have a response as much from the central banks as it will from the fiscal. So I think that's where everyone's got it wrong. Everyone's looking at this and saying. The next time we have a crisis, it's going to be like 2008. The central banks are going to provide all this liquidity. I think that the world has changed and the market and a lot of these governments have realized that they need to do fiscal at the same time. And I really believe that Trump is, is uh, kind of paved the way for, uh, you know, thinking about uh, deficits in a different way. Like, let's face it. He went and did fiscal stimulus, and, you know, in the eighth year of a business cycle when there was no need for it. And yeah. I really think that um, we're going to be surprised at how much fiscal stimulus comes the, you know, the next time we have any sorts of problems. And all I'm saying is there might be a secular decline in financial assets that the market has sniffed out. And that might be why these banks and all these financial services companies are kind of being offered. And that's all I'm, I'm saying. And I'm not even saying I'm sure about that. I'm just kind of, as you said it, I was thinking to myself, oh, you know what? I wonder if this is part of a larger shift in kind of leadership. Well, listen, our listeners can tune in each week for us to give an up update on what your thinking is on that, right? That's right. <laughs> you can shit all over. All right. So number four, what's number four, Kev? Buy the dip on lumber. So let me guess, is it uh, locked limit for a change? 
<laughs> for a change. <laughs> Lumber is my favorite well, commodity because uh, they basically – It literally goes lock limit every yeah. day. <laughs> so, so so, my buddy Tony in, a, in our podcast explained how there's seven guys in, in a pit and they basically – most days they get up, they either bid it to limit or, or offer it to limit and then go home. That's how the, that's how the pit works there. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, but, you know what? Do you, what are you thinking, so, Patrick? Well, I just I I see that. Look, lumber shit to bed after quite a bull run, right? Like like this bull run on lumber was pretty epic. I mean, it went from three hundred to like six forty to the upside in the course of the entire two thousand seventeen into the two thousand eighteen year. But then we had the proper bear market cleanse where this thing wipes out from 600 all the way back to 300 you know a, a 50 plus percent wipeout we get the bounce off of the low it was a pretty solid fast recovery from about 300 to 450 about a 50 percent rise off of its low we gave it back and it's trying to break out again it did not make lower lows uh, is this the first dip in a new run in lumber or is this just a fake out and the selling is going to continue to bring it all the way back down to the november december lows do you have an opinion well i can guess what yours is because you are always oh. you are always such a bear on housing and i'm sure you think that this is just headed the way of uh kind of the dirt nap like it's headed no 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 i'm actually i'm actually quite neutral oh. the, to me to me this actually is an asymmetric moment to try to go long. That doesn't mean I would stay long lumber, uh, but but this is always an opportunity to test whether the breakout is going to actually have any meat on the bone. Uh, but this would be interesting because imagine a breakout like this, like an attempt to rally lumber here at 391. Let's say it fails to break above 400 and then it's all the way back at 350 within a week. That's actually quite negative. So actually, I would, I, I, the way traders behave on lumber here in the next week or two is going to be a big tell. Hence why I wanted it in the top five. I want to see whether or not the last couple of days of attempting to rally lumber is for real or whether this becomes a, a little bit of a fake out. Uh, and, and that's what's on my mind. Okay, let's go on to number three. So... Listen, one of the things uh, I, I, you know, I swore not to read all the comments that are coming in on YouTube, but I always find myself in there just seeing what other people want to comment in there. And uh, one guy came on to our uh, YouTube feed and it's like, how can you guys not m mention the China A50 uh, or at least the China rally? And I was like, yeah, he's right. How could we not have mentioned this rally that occurred on um, uh, on uh, China? Patrick, wait, so well, I want to I want to interrupt there for a second. You've now set a dangerous precedent. Oh shit! <laughs> People are going to think everyone's going to come in there knowing, right. thinking that you can they can actually influence the top five things to watch. Don't they know this is a carefully curated list that we go back and forth, you know, for hours researching every week? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, but you know what, though, in fairness, uh, no, I've been watching the A A fifty. No, he's. I've been listen, watching. He's it. right. That 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 guy's obviously he, way he smarter right. than us. He's way smarter than us. The, yeah, obviously, yeah. <laughs> he's absolutely correct. This thing has been ripping, like it's just ripping. It's been ripping. So, but the question I have: Did we? By us now bringing it onto the show, are we Hulk smashing this? Yeah, for thing? sure. Listen, it's over. The fact that we brought it up, like you should be shorting this with both <laughs> fists. Like this is just like you should the, come screaming across the pit yelling sold, sold, sold. Because the when we yeah, when because because the huddle fuckers yeah. just it came out and, yeah. and, the market, and brought up the market uh, muddle, you, not the huddle, the muddle. Anyways, yeah, I completely agree. Uh, it's been amazing, though. It's like, what, 28 percent. Why don't you do your little squiggle math there and tell me how much it's ri risen? Oh, yeah. So so we, we got a rise here. Thirty yeah. percent since March. So uh, March fifth. Listen, these Chinese guys. And Sorry, no. So not not March fifth. So it's in January. These Chinese guys. This is like this market. It's not a real market. Let's face it. Like this isn't some. Uh, you know. Oh come on. They 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 have a real market. No no yeah, no. Don't, the don't equity say that. market is not. Well, a real what, because the glo because because the global equity guys can't participate there, or like why is it not a real market? Hey, listen, you can go and and you can trade it. Don't get me wrong. 
but it's 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 not a real market and that it's subject to swings that are just completely out of the blue when when the government says they want it higher it goes higher when they say they want it lower it goes lower like i remember one day that i i have a, on my blog i should pull it up they they said something to the fact that it was unpatriotic to sell your equities like on the banner of the led and on the like where their stock exchange was like stop and think about it. it's like the new york stock exchange saying you know it is unpatriotic to sell your 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 equities and and it's not like uh, it would be. It's even worse there because it probably affects your credit, your social credit store. So you know, yeah, like I can't ride the train because I sold my. That's stock. right. <laughs> so like, don't give me that this is a real market. Like I, you know, I I, I think that China is an important part of uh, the global economy. I think that too often Amer like the Westerners dismiss it. But to think that the Chinese stock market is actually reflective of anything more than liquidity and political kind of uh, desire is is naive. It, it's like it's not really. I, I don't want to. I don't want to agree with you. Okay, well that's uh, fine. But, but you know, you makes... you might be right. You might be right. But you know what? I I, I look at this like uh, as a chart, like anything else, and it's tradable in my mind. And right now. It was in an awful bear market that basically, like the emerging markets, just completely got wrecked through the entire 2018 year. We now have this idea that the tariffs may have uh, um, been lifted, which may not pan out. But the, the China stock market is reacting uh, based on this being bullish news and is running. I mean, I think, I think that's the driver. Wouldn't you think that that would be sort of the catalyst behind an advance? No, I think it's all liquidity you know based i don't think it has anything to do with the um with the actual the trade, trade war? war no i think it's really? liquidity i i disagree with you. okay that's I fine that's what makes a market but, but, but actually i just but, realized yeah. that i'm probably going to be banned from trading in china you know visiting china ever <laughs> you know i i should take all that back <laughs> oh dear take it all yeah, back dear over we'll, we'll edit we'll edit yeah, it out of the that's show right. here. please edit that out patrick because you know what i i, I really want to visit sometimes so I don't want to be on their their bad books, and I don't want the market huddle to be, uh, uh, you know, banned in China, blacklisted in China. Yeah, <laughs> and I've probably just guaranteed it. <laughs> all right, all right. But but by the way, what was interesting? I just want to touch one last thing, and then because we got to move on. But very quickly, thirty uh, percent or somewhere around thirty percent of the emerging markets EEM ETF is weighted into China. And no, I think it's going to be 30, that, isn't it? No, it is 30. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that. Yeah. And notice that even that China pop was not enough to cause the, uh, the emerging markets uh, ETF to gain any real traction in the last, uh, last month. Yeah. And so, so all of the other 70% of the emerging markets were simply not enough the China pop did not turn us. I, I, you know what? There are no shortage of really smart people that are trying to play the long EM against the short S and P, and I am totally against that trade. Uh, I, I honestly think it's uh, until the Fed is solving the global liquidity shortage dollars of shortage of U.S. dollars in the world. Uh, I just think it's too early. You can give me the whole argument that emerging markets are cheaper because they are cheaper on a valuation basis. They are definitely a better value. But I just do not believe the emerging market stock markets are going to outperform until we have some sort of a, a, a liquidity injection of some sort of U.S. dollars. And until then, I'm short. Well, you know what? Brent Johnson and from San Diego Capital would be like uh, patting you on the back, Patrick, and saying you finally came around to his idea. Well, actually, that's not true. You've always probably been in that camp, and I refuse I've to I've been be in that. that camp. I'm the other guy. I'm the fool trying to buy the cheap one and sell the expensive one, waiting for that spread. Look, but, but you're going to eventually be right. You're just way too early, dude. I hear you. You're just early. I hear you. You're, you know what? Uh, you're, because they are cheap. Your, your argument is not wrong. I just don't think that this is the time to put the trade on. That's all. I just think your timing's okay, off. Okay, sounds good. To see, you know. uh, so, so number two. U.S. retail sales and the CPI and the PPI. Well, yeah. Like, are we going to get that's self explanatory? Well, are we going to get yeah, like, CPI? Like, I don't think we get any inflation. In fact, I think it's going to surprise the other way. 
Like that's been you know kind what? of a consistent me- kind of theme of you know over the past but, little while. But, but just like we talked about throughout the show, just like we talked about throughout the show, I continue to believe that the U.S. economy surprises everyone in holding up longer uh, than the rest of the world. And I, you know what? Like I just don't believe it's in the first quarter of of this 2019 year that the U.S. economic data starts to uh, to get recessionary and start to roll over and deflation risks and all of this shit. I honestly think the U.S. economy shocks everyone and holds even potentially through the second quarter. And I think that the real weakness in the U.S. economy is more of a, a second half of the year story. Uh, and anyone looking for these monthly prints to be where the numbers will emerge, I just think it's early. Well, that's my gut. There feeling. you go, folks. You heard it. He put himself out on the line. He's telling you no but, slowdown but in you, sight. You, you, well, not in sight. It's just a too early. Okay. Uh, that's, I, I don't have a but, clue. But do, but do you have a different view? So I don't have a clue. Don't have a clue. But, uh, but I will tell you but, that. Uh, I'm guessing too. But. Yeah. But the reality is this thing is volatile and, and, uh, I, any one number could, you know, do poor and, and, and surprise everyone. I, I do think the surprise is not going to be on the direction that you're expecting. I think the surprise is going to be in, in that the economy ends up being weaker and more quickly than we think. Just like Canada, all of a sudden out of the blue, you know, our numbers look bad. I think the same thing's going to happen in the States. So whether it's this month, next month, I don't know. But I do think I'm, I'm kind of agreeing with you in that we're due for a kind of a slowdown. I don't know the timing. No one does know the timing, but I just think that the risk reward is not there to com- con- continue playing for, you know, the U S economy to keep being as strong as it has been. All right. Right. All right. So let's move on to number one. And number one is the Euro currency breakdown. The Euro USD is, uh, is breaking down. Uh, and uh, it, this is, where I wanted to play a little clip here. Let's let's have a watch. Sorry, Gabe. You're almost there. You're almost there, Gabe. Keep going. I'm here, sir. <laughs> sir, I'm here. I'm here. Reach up. Reach up now. Reach up. Reach up. Hold on, hold on. I got you. Don't you lose her, Gabe. Reach up. Now, Sylvester Stallone, you got to love that. That was a classic, isn't it? Yeah. So when I dug it up, um, if you, you know, the one thing that I noticed, did you check this guy out in behind on the uh, on the helicopter? Like what kind of crazy no. lunatic does he look like? Rewind the YouTube video and go look again. Like, who is this guy? Why does he look like a serial killer? Like, what's going on with that guy? Like, go back and look, and, like, you won't be able to look away because that guy is, like, as I was cutting it up, I was just like, holy shit, who is this guy, and why does he look like uh, Silence of the Lambs guy? Like, I just couldn't understand it. Uh, It's a weird, weird thing. Um, But Euro is hanging on by a thread. Let's see. Like, it's already over the edge of the cliff, and all that it's got is potentially Sylvester Stallone's hand holding on to the slipping glove here. Yeah, like but you know what? Easy... One thing is, we didn't play the full clip, and you know what happens to that chick, <laughs> that lady? I'm sorry, that lady. No, I don't. What You don't ruin the movie for me. Now i got to go watch <laughs> so, it. So, uh, <laughs> I, I, you know what? I think the Euro might have a long way to fall if that movie is any yeah. sort of any... Uh, Kind of oh, but listen, we can't be in consensus on this because we're gonna jinx the move. Uh, but listen, the euro is definitely broken down on this. Now, I never ever like to overread the first twenty-four hour reaction after the ECB. So the rest, uh, the rest of this week into next week uh, is gonna be important. But you know what? The U.S. dollar has been winding up for a big move. And this, because 57% of the dollar index is weighted in the euro, this this is like to make it or break it, right? Like, I mean, we could have a dollar index heading to a hundred handle uh, on the Dixie if uh, if this breaks, right? Well, so there you go. You're always, you love trading everything against the dollar. And actually, I like trading things. I like taking the dollar out of it. 
And I actually was looking yes. at the other day the uh, the Mercedes uh, Lexus spread, and I'll let you guess what that is. Uh, a Mercedes Lexus. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, what is that? Japan against Europe. Yeah. And I, I like. I'd rather be short that thing than like I was looking at that. And I was like, that's a great looking uh, short. Yeah. Yeah. yeah look at that. So, that, that. But that's... even better. The Mercedes Jaguar, or, sorry, not the Mercedes. Yeah, the Mercedes Jaguar spread. That one to me was just like, I love this trade. Like, I think this is the better. Uh, against a pound. Yeah. So uh, one of the things I've been perplexed by is that everyone, all these hedge fund guys are long, back out and like back it up a little bit like so you can see a longer term chart. There you go. Like this thing, I think this thing's headed a lot lower. A lot of these hedge fund guys are long pounds and it's, it's a crowded trade and it scares me anytime that all the, everyone, all the hedge funds tell me they're one way. I'm, I'm kind of nervous about it, but at the same time, I'm kind of looking at this trade and I'm thinking to myself, this is actually a better way to play it than just being long pounds. And, and, and listen, there's some real kind of big bears like Crispin O'Day, who's been one of the biggest, you know, Europe, uh, you know, Brexit kind of uh, cynics and, and he's short everything. That guy thinks the whole world's always coming to an end and stuff. He's actually long pounds because he thinks that the pound's overdone. I I don't I can't bring myself to buy pound against the you against. I can't. Yeah, you probably can, but I much prefer this. I trade. can't. I can't. No, oh, no, no can't. I can't. I I can't. I can't. I'm with you. So I think this is uh, a great trade. I right. think this is a great way to play it. So I think instead yeah. of buying pounds and going back to your trade about I can't short euro against the dollar. Why, why not? I don't know. I just I don't like it. It's just it gets. Oh, my God. You're soft. Well, Jesus, just do it. I don't know. Like the dollar is the easiest trade. I just feel like you, you're just, you just getting too fancy. Dude. Well, it could be like it could be. But anyways, you heard it here. So I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you what I'll take. Look, I'll take this doll. Look at this dollar index is coming right to the freaking high. You take the breakout here on the Dixie. This thing is ripping to the 100 and maybe even 100 and 305 highs. Like this this is a no-brainer trade. You're trying to play all these fancy euro pound crosses and shit. Just freaking go long the dollar for God's sake. I hear you and I understand your <laughs> argument. I'm going to take the other side. I'm just going to say I'll I'll tell you what. I think that the euro the Mercedes Jaguar spread is a better trade than just shorting euro. Okay. But but you know what? Listen, we got to make this quick because I don't want to just go on a tangent too much. But what is happening with a lot of these emerging market currencies? First of all, uh, look at the uh, Brazilian real. Um, uh, real is it real? Real. I have no right? idea. It's real. Wait, hey, listen, and, but, Patrick. When you're asking me for pronunciation, you got problems, buddy. You got problems. <laughs> so, so <laughs> look. But look at the breakdown here. It's rolling over. Yeah. But look at the uh, Argentinian peso. Fresh freaking new low. Yeah. Listen, you're right. Right. Listen, the dollar. Right. The uh, no, no. But but what but, scares me is that all of a sudden you get a Trump tweet and all of a sudden things change overnight with the dollar, and that's what. But scares look, me. look at the way. Look at the way this this Turkish lira is rolling over, dude. The, uh, dude, the, to me, the uh, what I, all I'm saying is is that it's really feeling like this U.S. dollar trade can happen right now. I'm not listen. I, I there's no guarantees, but something is buzzing here, and we shouldn't take our eyes off it. I want to follow up on this one not only next week, but we have to kind of every once in a while on the show here in the next couple of months is really track what's happening here because if this breakout's happening, we can, we got to be on the ball here for all of our listeners. Well, there we go. It sounds like Patrick is a as a U.S. dollar bull, folks. I, well, I, there's there's been no dispute. Yeah. This is why I love Brent Johnson. Yeah. He's He's the uh, su smartest guy in the room. Smartest guy in the room. There you go. You heard it. <laughs> okay, well, that, we got the top five things to watch next week. All right. So, listen, give us the parting words of wisdom for all of our well, listeners. Well, I dug one up from uh, Barton Biggs. And for those who don't know, Barton Biggs, actually, I was looking through his uh, kind of biography, and I didn't realize this, but he started one of the first hedge funds. And I had no idea. I always, to me, he was always the guy, uh, the strategist at Morgan Stanley. But in 1965, Barton co-founded one of the industry's first hedge funds, Fairfield Partners. Like that's a long time ago, 65. Uh, yeah. 
And uh, they didn't have computers back yeah, then. Yeah, they dude. had no algos to run. Anyways, I, you know what? This extreme. By the way, this extreme beer is pretty. I, you know, I've used the word dude like three times or four times now. Like <laughs> this extremist beer has has like made me like some surfer dude or <laughs> surfer something. Surfer dude. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to Florida, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go like grab a surfboard. That's right. I'm, I'm gonna. Anyway, okay, on. so I'm gonna just like. <laughs> so, anyways, back to Barton Biggs. Burn Biggs has always been somebody that I respected. I've always enjoyed listening to what he says. I didn't realize that he was a, one of the first hedge fund managers. He then went on to be the Morgan Stanley strategist for many years. And then after that, started his, another hedge fund, Traxxas Partners. Um, he's always struck me as somebody very wise. And when I was going through all the different uh, kind of wisdom that I have in my database, this one seemed especially appropriate for having Mark Spiegel on with the kind of extreme manic behavior we're seeing in the markets. And I'll, and I'll read it to you, Barton Biggs, kind of, kind of words of wisdom. He says, Mr. Market is a manic depressive with huge mood swings, and you should bet against him, not with him, particularly when he is raving. So I, I and, and not only that, it also coincides with what we experienced in terms of our, uh, uh, this week in market history with the fact that in when the market in 2009 was getting given away at, at 666 versus today, yeah. I feel like we're at one of those manic mood swings. And the trouble is that, uh, you know, when you're around a crazy person every now and then you begin to think that they make sense. And too many people are, are thinking that, that, that the market makes sense right now. And uh, I'm with, I must admit, I'm with Mark Spiegel. I think that Tesla makes no sense. And I think that uh, as well with the stock market. That's, that's because you've got that CFA thing, right? Yeah, the CFA thing. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> well, maybe let everyone in on that joke later. But, uh, but <laughs> anyway, so that's our parting anyway. wisdom for this week. And, uh, you know, we'll just uh, leave it at that. And uh, yeah, yeah. Let's grab our uh, the the things we have to say at the end. Do you have that ready, uh, Patrick? Yeah, I do. So, uh, well, first of all, thanks to our sponsor, uh, this uh, extremist uh, Belgian style IPA. I mean, what what did you think of it? I mean, it's pretty strong, but it is actually pretty cool flavors in there. Yeah. Like, uh, so uh, I, I I don't know if I don't know if I could have more than one of these. Yeah. But well, but it, I had it's, two, it's, it's so not, I, I'm not doing. I, <laughs> I do think that <laughs> no wonder yeah. you're no wonder you're actually doing all these uh, Jaguar trades. Yeah, that's right. So I, I definitely <laughs> have come to the conclusion that it's not pine and it's not a spruce. It's more a tamarack. So, you know, a tamarack. A tamarack. So that's right. what it tastes a little more like. And uh, and we'll go from there. Thank you for uh, what uh, Napanee beer sponsor for uh, what is it called again? Napanee uh, Napanee beer. Yeah, na there you go. Yeah. So, and I think it was very fitting for having Mark uh, Spiegel on because he is an extremist. Yes, he yeah, is. and he was great. Like yes, I just enjoyed having him on. And, and well, listen, he's got. Uh, uh, listen, our listeners got to stick around because we have him here after this show, the continued and extended uh, interview with him. So stick around yeah. for that. But also, if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can follow us uh, at the Market Huddle, or you can follow Kevin at Kevin Muir. Or myself at Patrick Serezna on Twitter. Uh, any other closing words? Well, no. We're doing a little new thing on the uh, YouTube account where we're cutting up the uh, segment into different parts. So watch for that because if you found that uh, you can't take kind of an hour and a half of Patrick and I, which I completely understand. I don't know if I could take it. Yeah, either. I totally get it. Uh, we're going to actually divide the segments up into into more manageable chunks so you can kind of uh, you know watch it uh, bit by bit. So just keep your eye out for that. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us, and uh, stay tuned for Mark's uh, extended interview. That's right. Take care. Have a great week, guys. All right. So, Mark, uh, I have to ask you. I look at this picture of you, and there's these <laughs> flames behind you on this. Is that a burning Tesla car that you have yeah, in the so, background? Is this? Yeah, so I did a podcast. I think it was last year or the year before. It was called, I think, Hidden Voices. It was a good guy who did it. And he actually came up with that picture to promote it. He put this Photoshop thing of me standing in front of this burning tablet. And by the way, you can't see it because Twitter cut it off because I, you pulled this, I think, off my Twitter picture. But to the right, that's actually Elon Musk on fire also. Like, if you see him. Oh, wow. 
that's that he's okay, like you got a forward I saw and that's his that's his right arm and he's like all in flames too but he got cut off <laughs> probably just as oh well. wow you got to send us this picture that this is this is gonna that's gonna go out in a tweet <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know if i still have the whole picture i'd have to look but yeah that he was that was actually him too so yeah so, Mark, I was going uh, and digging through some of my uh, kind of my old posts and things that we've kind of chatted about in the past, and I dug one up, and I realized that you are also an ag bull, agriculture commodities. And so I figured since I'm suffering and uh, and I, I, I would like someone com- to commiserate with me and in terms of this trade just not working, and maybe you could kind of outline what you're thinking there. And, and I'm just wondering, are you giving up on this d- decline, or are you just buying more? You know, I'm not giving up. I'm, look, I'm first of all, what I know about ag, you know, you could probably write on a postage stamp, okay? Um, but but what I do know is, you know, these prices certainly adjusted for inflation. And actually, I, I own this through through the ETF uh, ticker is DBA, uh, David Boy Alpha, um, which is based on an underlying index from Deutsche Bank. That index is at, is is back where it was in like, you know, early 2002. Right. And, you know, I know it's a cliche, but people got to eat. Right. And I know that, yeah, there's more production now, but increase in production is slowing down. There are farms, unfortunately, that are going bankrupt because of this pricing. And that's going to pull, you know, production away. Weather has been perfect to grow stuff, you know, for the last few years. You know, perfect doesn't continue forever. And then, of course, you know, China slapped these like 25 percent tariffs on a bunch of our ag products. And if Trump's going to do anything on this deal with China, it's going to be to get rid of that because his voting base or, you know, or these Midwestern farm states and, you know, without them, he's, he's really cooked in, in the 2020 election. So this is really a, it's, it's a contrarian play for me. And, you know, um, it's, it's a pretty big position because it, it's, it's not levered. It's pretty diversified. You know, there's like whatever, 10 or 12 different ag products in this ETF. I can't lose that much on it. You know, it's kind of like sliding lately a little bit every day, but you know, it's, it's at $16 and 21 cents. It was down 13 cents. I mean, it's not the kind of thing that's going to go down two, $3 in a day or even over, over a few months. And so, you know, it's like, it's one of these things every once in a while, there's something like it's, it's real and you just know it's going to be worth more than it is now. I mean, it's just completely hated. So, you know, it's look the same, you know, you know, another sort of macro, position of mine i've been you know short the yen against the dollar long usd jpy literally since late 2012 when it was 79 you know and it, it got up to i don't know 125 and now it's like the 111 it's not a widow maker for me I, you know i'm i'm using barely any leverage i actually did it through this through this two times short etf which is pretty good it's a very low expense thing so I'm, you could say i'm levered two to one uh, look i know where the yen's going eventually all you macro guys know where it's going eventually. It's just a matter of the timing, right? So, you know, I'm, so I'm perfectly comfortable holding this for five or 10 more years. It costs me very little and I'm not levered on it. You know, it's that kind of a thing. I'm short, again, through an ETF, I'm short, you know, European sovereign debt. You know, the ticker on that one is BMDX, Boy, Nancy, David X-Ray. And, you know, there's actually a, through my prime broker, which is IB, the 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 net sort of rebate on the short position covers the the payout on that. It's not levered at all, you know. But it's got like if the average paper in there is like nine year paper yielding, you know, like seventy or eighty basis points. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? So eventually, those bond prices are going to collapse. Is it going to happen tomorrow or in fifteen years? I don't know. But you know, there's there's no cost of carry to it or a, a tiny one. I'm not levered, so it's not going to be a widow maker. You know, there's a floor there. I mean, you know, how low is how low is 10 year sovereign debt going to go? Zero. Okay, so what can I lose from from 80 basis points? So I have positions like that where I just patiently park the money and and don't worry about them month to month or or for that matter even year to year. And then and then there's these sort of micro caps and nano caps, which I'm long. And you know, sometimes they work in three months, and sometimes it takes three years for them to work, but they've almost always worked for me. And basically the reason is I buy them with a huge margin for error in terms of, I, I like to buy really cheap, high margin revenue. You know, I don't worry about that the company's making money. 
I just want a good balance sheet, you know, plenty of net cash. If they're losing some money, you know, I like to have, see them have seven, eight years of current burn. And eventually somebody buys the company to get the revenue. You know, if you've got, if, you, if, if you've got a, a company with 50% gross margin revenue, you know, selling at 25% of revenue, you know, like less than, less than one times annual gross profit, some company will come along and buy them if, if the company doesn't get fixed. And, and, and that's always happened for me. It either gets fixed or somebody buys them. So, you know, I bought a bunch of stuff like that uh, when the markets were crashing in December. And subsequently, I, I, I bought, I, I think I bought like five companies. I subsequently sold three of the five and, and now I'm holding two of them, you know, just two that haven't really, haven't moved. The other ones moved pretty well or the market got a little bit overheated or whatever. So, you know, that's so what I do. You, I'm, how I'm do you, sort of how do you? Like, how ahead. do you find those, Mark? How do you find those? Like, are you running screens? Are I, you just reading research? Like, how do you go? So, I, so you're I, running screens. One thing I do is I, I do screens for, uh, you know, my, my, my the first thing I'll look at on any company is EV to revenue, and then I'll look at, at margins in the balance sheet. And so I do screens for that. The other thing I do is I do news screens for, you know, small companies that meet certain criteria that that moved on a given day, and then I look and see if they have news. And, and I found things that way, you know, like, is there a reason why they moved or is it just, you know, a, a $3 stock that trades 15,000 shares a day and it was up 6% on 10,000 shares, you know, which happens more often than not. Right. But if a company right. moved and there's a reason I find those and, you know, just to be clear, you know, a lot of these names I know by now, cause a lot of them show up again and again in the screen, but you know, I might look at, at a hundred companies and buy one, you know, I, I'll buy, you know, in a typical year I might buy, seven or eight new names a year and and they tend to be you know anywhere from eight percent to to twenty percent positions in the fund you know i try not to get that big on on on, an, on a small individual company just because that you know the risk can kill you i don't have any problem putting twenty percent of the fund or twenty five percent of the fund in an etf you know because that's a different risk profile but these little companies typically they're like ten percent positions for me Kev's. Oh, uh, hold on. Yeah, yeah we, we lost, lost Kevin Jeff there. Oh, there he is. He's back. Sorry. Is guys. he? Yeah, 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 I'm back. Yeah, we lost you there. Okay, just keep going. Sorry, you have a thing, guys. All right. No, no, that's fine. So you ended there. Is there anything else we wanted to cover? Uh, just before, uh, like, where, where do we're no. all, we'll just. Oh, yeah, because we're, you know what? This. We have to, you probably have to get going, Mark. Yeah. So um, why don't we just let Mark uh, pitch whatever he wants to, or not pitch, like, or to, like, give a kind of shout out to whatever he wants to uh, shout out to. All right, I'll do that here. Okay. All right, sounds good. So, Mark, uh, thanks so much uh, for joining us. Uh, why don't you let our listeners know a little bit about uh, what you do and the, how they can follow you and or learn more about what your uh, your fund and everything else? Well, you can follow me on on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Mark B Spiegel. M A R K, uh, letter B is in boy. S P I E G E L. Um, and you know, my fund letter. I publish a pretty extensive letter every month. Uh, talking about what I own and the fund and why we have it and what we're doing. And recently, Seeking Alpha has been uh, publishing those when I send it to them. And also, Value Walk publishes excerpts of them. So people can people can follow it there, you know. Um, but, yeah, so listen, follow me on Twitter. I mean, just realize that it's at least for now, until it finally collapses, my Twitter feed is probably <laughs> 85% Tesla. And it's, you know, it's very politically incorrect. I mean, my LPs tend to be, I don't have institutional LPs, they, other than like the friends and family crew, and I'm a big part of the fund myself, they tend to be hedge fund guys themselves, either current or retired, who don't give a flying fuck about political correctness. So they're, you know, well, any I, kind I of off-color to... jokes I do... Yeah, like I can that. attest to that, Mark. I like I, I follow you on Twitter, and sometimes I'm just laughing myself silly and saying, "Holy smokes, uh, he has got guts to post that!" But they just make me laugh so hard that I appreciate every single one, even the ones that are kind of close to the line, and even those that are over the line. Anyways, thanks a lot for coming, right, Mark. Well, we really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, you know, like the teachers. Union Pension Fund is not going to be in, in my fund, but that's okay. I have fun with it. <laughs> Thanks, guys. It, it, was, it was a lot of fun being on here. And and, um, and by the way, as you know, Kevin, I love your your blog entries. You're doing them less frequently now that you're, you know, again, you know, working for a living. But 
when you do them, they're they're fantastic. I mean, really oh, insightful I... and 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 really great stuff. So I thank you for that. Well, that's very kind of you to say. Um, although, Mark, I, I'd like to call myself the play, playboy of financial newsletter writers. Everyone says they're subscribing for the articles, but we all know they're just looking at the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you very much. Take okay, care. See you later, bud. All right. Thanks, Mark. Bye. Cheers. Uh, okay. Bye-bye.